Chapter One of My Lady's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins. Part of the First The Disappearance. Chapter One. Old Lady Lydiard sat meditating by the fireside, with three letters lying open on her lap. Time had discolored the paper, and had turned the ink to a brownish hue. The letters were all addressed to the same person, the Right Honourable Lord Lydiard, and were all signed in the same way, your affectionate cousin, James Talmage. Judged by these specimens of his correspondence, Mr. Talmage must have possessed one great merit as a letter-writer, the merit of brevity. He will weary nobody's patience, if he is allowed to have a hearing." Let him, therefore, be permitted, in his own high-flown way, to speak for himself. First Letter My statement, as your lordship requests, shall be short and to the point. I was doing very well as a portrait painter in the country, and I had a wife and children to consider. Under the circumstances, if I had been left to decide for myself, I should certainly have waited until I had saved a little money before I ventured on the serious expense of taking a house and studio at the west end of London. Your lordship, I positively declare, encouraged me to try the experiment without waiting. And here I am, unknown and unemployed, a helpless artist lost in London, with a sick wife and hungry children, and bankruptcy staring me in the face. On whose shoulders does this dreadful responsibility rest? On your lordship's. Second letter. After a week's delay, you favor me, my lord, with a curt reply. I can be equally curt on my side. I indignantly deny that I or my wife ever presumed to see your lordship's name as a means of recommendation to sitters without your permission. Some enemy has slandered us. I claim as my right to know the name of that enemy. Third and last letter. Another week has passed and not a word of answer has reached me from your lordship. It matters little. I have employed the interval in making inquiries, and I have at last discovered the hostile influence which has estranged you from me. I have been, it seems, so unfortunate as to offend Lady Lydiard, how I cannot imagine, and the all-powerful influence of this noble lady is now used against the struggling artist who is united to you by the sacred ties of kindred. Be it so." I can fight my way upwards, my lord, as other men have done before me. A day may yet come when the throng of carriages waiting at the door of the fashionable portrait painter will include her ladyship's vehicle, and bring me the tardy expression of her ladyship's regret. I refer you, my lord Lydiard, to that day. Having read Mr. Tolmage's formidable assertions relating to herself for the second time, Lady Lydiard's meditations came to an abrupt end. She rose took the letters in both hands to tear them up, hesitated, and threw them back in the cabinet drawer in which she had discovered them, among other papers that had not been arranged since Lord Lydiard's death. "'The idiot!' said her ladyship, thinking of Mr. Tolmage. "'I never even heard of him in my husband's lifetime. I never even knew that he was really related to Lord Lydiard, till I found his letters. What is to be done next?' She looked, as she put that question to herself, at an open newspaper thrown on the table, which announced the death of that accomplished artist, Mr. Tolmage, related, it is said, to the late well-known connoisseur, Lord Lydiard. In the next sentence, the writer of the obituary notice deplored the destitute condition of Mrs. Tolmage and her children, thrown helpless on the mercy of the world. Lady Lydiard stood by the table with her eyes on those lines, and saw but too plainly the direction in which they pointed, the direction of her checkbook. Turning toward the fireplace, she rang the bell. I can do nothing in this matter, she thought to herself, until I know whether the report about Mrs. Tolmage and her family is to be dependent on. Has Moody come back? she asked, when the servant appeared at the door. Moody, otherwise her ladyship's steward, had not come back. Lady Lydiard dismissed the subject of the artist's widow from further consideration until the steward returned, and gave her mind to a question of domestic interest which lay nearer to her heart. Her favorite dog had been ailing for some time past, and no report of him had reached her that morning. She opened a door near the fireplace, which led, through a little corridor hung with rare prints, to her own boudoir. "'Isabel!' she called out. 
How is Tommy? A fresh young voice answered from behind the curtain which closed the further end of the corridor. No better, my lady. A low growl followed the fresh young voice and added, in dog's language, Much worse, my lady, much worse. Lady Lydiard closed the door again, with a compassionate sigh for Tommy, and walked slowly to and fro in her spacious drawing-room, waiting for the steward's return. Accurately described, Lord Lydiard's widow was short and fat, and in the matter of age, perilously near her sixtieth birthday. But it may be said, without paying a compliment, that she looked younger than her age by ten years at least. Her complexion was of that delicate pink tinge which is sometimes seen in old women with well-preserved constitutions. Her eyes, equally well-preserved, were of that hard light blue color which wears well, and does not wash out when tried by the test of tears. Add to this her short nose, her plump cheeks that set wrinkles at defiance, her white hair dressed in stiff little curls, and, if a doll could grow old, Lady Lydiard, at sixty, would have been the living image of that doll, taking life easily on its journey downward to the prettiest of tombs, in a burial ground where the myrtles and roses grew all the year round. These being her ladyship's personal merits, impartial history must acknowledge, on the list of her defects, a total want of tact and taste in her attire. The lapse of time since Lord Lydiard's death had left her at liberty to dress as she pleased. She arrayed her short, clumsy figure in colors that were far too bright for a woman of her age. Her dresses, badly chosen as to their hues, were perhaps not badly made, but were certainly badly worn. Morally, as well as physically, it must be said of Lady Lydiard that her outward side was her worst side. The anomalies of her dress were matched by the anomalies of her character. There were moments when she felt and spoke as became a lady of rank and there were other moments when she felt and spoke as might have become the cook in the kitchen. Beneath these superficial inconsistencies, the great heart, the essentially true and generous nature of the woman, only waited the sufficient occasion to assert themselves. In the trivial intercourse of society, she was open to ridicule on every side of her. But when a serious emergency tried the metal of which she was really made, the people who were loudest in laughing at her stood aghast, and wondered what had become of the familiar companion of their everyday lives. Her ladyship's promenade had lasted but a little while, when a man in black clothing presented himself noiselessly at the great door which opened on the staircase. Lady Lydiard signed to him impatiently to enter the room. "'I've been expecting you for some time, Moody,' she said. "'You look tired. Take a chair.' The man in black bowed respectfully, and took his seat. End of Chapter 1 Recording by Todd Chapter Two of My Lady's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins. Part One, Chapter Two. Robert Moody was at this time nearly forty years of age. He was a shy, quiet, dark person with a pale, closely shaven face agreeably animated by large black eyes set deep in their orbits. His mouth was perhaps his best feature. He had firm, well-shaped lips, which softened on rare occasions into a particularly winning smile. The whole look of the man, in spite of his habitual reserve, declared him to be eminently trustworthy. His position in Lady Lydiard's household was in no sense of the menial sort. He acted as her almoner and secretary as well as her steward, distributed her charities, wrote her letters on business, paid her bills, engaged her servants, stocked her wine cellar, was authorized to borrow books from her library, and was served with his meals in his own room. His parentage gave him claims to these special favors. He was by birth entitled to rank as a gentleman. His father had failed at a time of commercial panic as a country banker, had paid a good dividend, and had died in exile abroad a broken-hearted man. Robert had tried to hold his place in the world, but adverse fortune kept him down. Undeserved disaster followed him from one employment to another until he abandoned the struggle, bade a last farewell to the pride of other days, and accepted the position considerably and delicately offered to him in Lady Lydiard's house. He had now no near relations living, and he had never made many friends. In the intervals of occupation he led a lonely life in his little room. It was a matter of secret wonder among the women in the servants' hall considering his personal advantages and the opportunities which must surely have been thrown in his way, 
that he had never tempted fortune in the character of a married man. Robert Moody entered into no explanations on that subject. In his own sad and quiet way he continued to lead his own sad and quiet life. The woman, all failing, from the handsome housekeeper downward to make the smallest impression on him, consoled themselves by prophetic visions of his future relations with the sex, and predicted vindictively that his time would come. Well, said Lady Lydiard, and what have you done? Your ladyship seemed to be anxious about the dog, Moody answered, in the low tone which was habitual to him. I went first to the veterinary surgeon. He has been called away into the country, and... Lady Lydiard waved away the conclusion of the sentence with her hand. Never mind the surgeon. We must find somebody else. Where did you go next? To your ladyship's lawyer. Mr. Troy wished me to say that he will have the honor of waiting on you. Pass over the lawyer, Moody. I want to know about the painter's widow. Is it true that Mrs. Tolmage and her family are left in helpless poverty? Not quite true, my lady. I have seen the clergyman of the parish, who takes an interest in the case. Lady Lydiard interrupted her steward for the third time. Did you mention my name? she asked sharply. Certainly not, my lady. I followed my instructions, and described you as a benevolent person in search of cases of real distress. It is quite true that Mr. Tolmage has died, leaving nothing to his family. But the widow has a little income of seventy pounds in her own right. Is that enough to live on, Moody? her ladyship asked. Enough, in this case, for the widow and her daughter, Moody answered. The difficulty is to pay the few debts left standing, and to start the two sons in life. They are reported to be steady lads, and the family is much respected in the neighborhood. The clergyman proposes to get a few influential names to begin with, and to start a subscription. No subscription, protested Lady Lydiard. Mr. Tolmage was Lord Lydiard's cousin, and Mrs. Tolmage is related to his lordship by marriage. It would be degrading to my husband's memory to have the begging-box sent round for his relations, no matter how distant they may be. Cousins! exclaimed her ladyship, suddenly descending from the lofty ranges of sentiment to the low. I hate the very name of them, a person who is near enough to me to be my relation, and far enough off from me to be my sweetheart, is a double-faced sort of person that I don't like. Let's get back to the widow and her sons. How much do they want? A subscription of five hundred pounds, my lady, would provide for everything, if it could only be collected. It shall be collected, Moody. I will pay the subscription out of my own purse. Having asserted herself in those noble terms, she spoilt the effect of her own outburst of generosity by dropping to the sordid view of the subject in her next sentence. Five hundred pounds is a good bit of money, though, isn't it, Moody? It is indeed, my lady. Rich and generous as he knew his mistress to be, her proposal to pay the whole subscription took the steward by surprise. Lady Lydiard's quick perception instantly detected what was passing in his mind. "'You don't quite understand my position in this matter,' she said. "'When I read the newspaper notice of Mr. Tolmage's death, I searched among his lordship's papers to see if they really were related. I discovered some letters from Mr. Tolmage which showed me that he and Lord Lydiard were cousins.' One of those letters contained some very painful statements, reflecting most untruly and unjustly on my conduct. Lies, in short, her ladyship burst out, losing her dignity as usual. Lies, Moody, for which Mr. Tolmage deserved to be horsewhipped. I would have done it myself if his lordship had told me at the time. No matter, it's useless to dwell on the thing now, she continued, ascending again to the forms of expression which became a lady of rank. This unhappy man has done me a gross injustice. My motives may be seriously misjudged if I appear personally in communicating with his family. If I relieve them anonymously in their present trouble, I spare them the exposure of a public subscription, and I do what I believe his lordship would have done himself if he had lived. My desk is on the other table. Bring it here, Moody, and let me return good for evil while I'm in the humor for it. Moody obeyed in silence. Lady Lydiard wrote a check. Take that to the bankers and bring back a five-hundred-pound note she said. I'll enclose it to the clergyman as coming from an unknown friend. And be quick about it. I am only a fallible mortal, Moody. Don't leave me time enough to take the stingy view of five hundred pounds. Moody went out with a check. No delay was to be apprehended in obtaining the money. The banking-house was hard by, in St. James's Street. 
Left alone, Lady Lydiard decided on occupying her mind in the generous direction by composing her anonymous letter to the clergyman. She had just taken a sheet of notepaper from her desk when a servant appeared at the door announcing a visitor. Mr. Felix Sweet, sir. End of chapter 2 Recording by Todd Chapter 3 of My Lady's Money This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins Part 1, Chapter 3 "'My nephew!' Lady Lydiard exclaimed in a tone which expressed astonishment, but certainly not pleasure as well. "'How many years is it since you and I last met?' she asked, in her abruptly straightforward way, as Mr. Felix Sweetser approached her writing-table. The visitor was not a person easily discouraged. He took Lady Lydiard's hand and kissed it with easy grace. A shade of irony was in his manner, agreeably relieved by a playful flash of tenderness. A "'Years, my dear aunt?' he said. Look in your glass, and you will see that time has stood still since we met last. How wonderfully well you wear! When shall we celebrate the appearance of your first wrinkle? I am too old. I shall never live to see it. He took an easy chair, uninvited, placed himself close at his aunt's side, and ran his eye over her ill-chosen dress with an air of satirical admiration. How perfectly successful! he said with his well-bred insolence. What a chaste gaiety of color! "'What do you want?' asked her ladyship, not in the least softened by the compliment. "'I want to pay my respects to my dear aunt,' Felix answered, perfectly impenetrable to his ungracious reception, and perfectly comfortable in a spacious armchair. No pen-and-ink portrait need surely be drawn of Felix Sweetser. He is too well known a picture in society. The little lithe man, with his bright restless eyes, and his long iron-gray hair falling in curls to his shoulders, his airy step and his cordial manner, his uncertain age, his innumerable accomplishments, and his unbounded popularity. Is he not familiar everywhere, and welcome everywhere? How grateful he receives, how prodigally he repays, the cordial appreciation of an admiring world. Every man he knows is a charming fellow. Every woman he sees is sweetly pretty. What picnics he gives on the banks of the Thames in the summer season, what a well-earned little income he derives from the whist-table! What an inestimable actor he is at private theatricals of all sorts, weddings included! Did you never read Sweetser's novel, dashed off in the intervals of curative perspiration at a German bath? Then you don't know what brilliant fiction really is. He has never written a second work. He does everything, and only does it once. One song, the despair of professional composers. One picture, just to show how easily a gentleman can take up an art and drop it again. A really multiform man, with all the graces and all the accomplishments scintillating perpetually at his fingers' ends. If these poor pages have achieved nothing else, they have done a service to persons not in society by presenting them to sweet sir. In his gracious company the narrative brightens, and the writer and reader, catching reflected brilliancy, understand each other at last, thanks to sweet sir. Well, said Lady Lydiard, now you are here, what have you got to say for yourself? You have been abroad, of course. Where? Principally at Paris, my dear aunt, the only place that is fit to live in, for this excellent reason, that the French are the only people who know how to make the most of life. One has relations and friends in England, and every now and then one returns to London. When one has spent all one's money in Paris, her ladyship interposed, that's what you were going to say, isn't it? Felix submitted to the interruption, with his delightful good humor. "'What a bright creature you are!' he exclaimed. "'What would I not give for your flow of spirits? "'Yes, one does spend money in Paris, as you say. "'The clubs, the stock exchange, the race course. "'You try your luck here, there, and everywhere. "'And you lose, and win, win, and lose. "'And you haven't a dull day to complain of. He paused. His smile died away. He looked inquiringly at Lady Lydiard. "'What a wonderful existence yours must be,' he resumed. "'The everlasting question with your needy fellow-creatures, "'Where am I to get money?' "'is a question that has never passed your lips. "'Enviable woman!' He paused once more, surprised and puzzled this time. 
what is the matter my dear aunt you seem to be suffering under some uneasiness i am suffering under your conversation her ladyship answered sharply money is a sore subject with me just now she went on with her eyes on her nephew watching the effect of what she said i have spent five hundred pounds this morning with a scrape of my pen and only a week since i yielded to temptation and made an addition to my picture gallery she looked as she said those words towards an archway at the further end of the room closed by curtains of purple velvet i really tremble when i think of what that one picture cost me before i could call it mine a landscape by hobema and the national gallery bidding against me but never mind she concluded consoling herself as usual with considerations that were beneath her hobema will sell at my death for a bigger price than i gave for him that's one comfort she looked again at felix a smile of mischievous satisfaction began to show itself in her face anything wrong with your watch chain she asked felix absently playing with his watch chain started as if his aunt had suddenly awakened him while lady lydiard had been speaking his vivacity had subsided little by little and had left him looking so serious and so old that his most intimate friend would hardly have known him again roused by the sudden question that had been put to him he seemed to be casting about in his mind in search of the first excuse for his silence that might turn up i was wondering he began why i missed something when i look round this beautiful room something familiar you know that i fully expected to find here tommy suggested lady lydiard still watching her nephew as maliciously as ever that's it cried felix seizing his excuse and rallying his spirits why don't i hear tommy snarling behind me why don't i feel tommy's teeth in my trousers the smile vanished from lady lydiard's face the tone taken by her nephew in speaking of her dog was disrespectful in the extreme she showed him plainly that she disapproved of it felix went on nevertheless impenetrable to reproof of the silent sort dear little tommy so delightfully fat and such an infernal temper i don't know whether i hate him or love him where is he ill in bed answered her ladyship with a gravity which startled even felix himself i wish to speak to you about tommy you know everybody do you know of a good dog doctor the person i have employed so far doesn't at all satisfy me professional person inquired felix yes all humbugs my dear aunt the worse the dog gets the bigger the bill grows don't you see i've got the man for you a gentleman knows more about horses and dogs than all the veterinary surgeons put together we met in the boat yesterday crossing the channel lord rotherfield's youngest son alfred hardyman the owner of the stud farm the man who has bred the famous racehorses cried lady lydiard my dear felix how can i presume to trouble such a great personage about my dog felix burst into his genial laugh never was modesty more woefully out of place he rejoined hardyman is dying to be presented to your ladyship he has heard like everybody of the magnificent decorations of this house and he is longing to see them his chambers are close by in pall mall if he is at home we will have him here in five minutes perhaps i had better see the dog first lady lydiard shook her head isabel says that she is not to be disturbed she answered isabel understands him better than anybody felix lifted his lively eyebrows with a mixed expression of curiosity and surprise who is isabel lady lydiard was vexed with herself for carelessly mentioning isabel's name in her nephew's presence felix was not the sort of person whom she was desirous of admitting to her confidence in domestic matters isabel is an addition to my household since you were here last she answered shortly young and pretty inquired felix ah you look serious and you don't answer me young and pretty evidently which may i see first the addition to your household or the addition to your picture gallery you look at the picture gallery i am answered again he rose to approach the archway and stopped at his first step forward a sweet girl is a dreadful responsibility aunt he resumed with an ironical assumption of gravity do you know i shouldn't be surprised if isabel in the long run cost you more than hobema who is this at the door the person at the door was robert moody returned from the bank mr felix sweetsir being nearsighted 
was obliged to fit his eyeglass in position before he could recognize the prime minister of Lady Lydiard's household. Ha! Our noble Moody! How well he wears! Not a gray hair on his head! And look at mine! What dye do you use, Moody? If he had my open dispositions, he would tell. As it is, he looks unutterable things and holds his tongue. Ah! If I could only have held my tongue when I was in the diplomatic service, you know, what a position I might have occupied by this time. Don't let me interrupt you, Moody, if you have anything to say to Lady Lydiard. Having acknowledged Mr. Sweet Sir's lively greeting by a formal bow, and a grave look of wonder which respectfully repelled that vivacious gentleman's flow of humor, Moody turned towards his mistress. "'Have you got the bank-note?' asked her ladyship. Moody laid the bank-note on the table. "'Am I in the way?' inquired Felix. "'No,' said his aunt. "'I have a letter to write. It won't occupy me for more than a few minutes. You can stay here, or go and look at the Hobema, which you please.' Felix made a second sauntering attempt to reach the picture-gallery. Arrived within a few steps of the entrance, he stopped again, attracted by an open cabinet of Italian workmanship, filled with rare old china. Being nothing if not a cultivated amateur, Mr. Sweetser paused to pay his passing tribute of admiration before the contents of the cabinet. "'Charming, charming,' he said to himself, with his head twisted appreciatively a little on one side. Lady Lydiard and Moody left him in undisturbed enjoyment of the china, and went on with the business of the banknote. "'Ought we to take the number of the note in case of accident?' asked her ladyship. Moody produced a slip of paper from his waistcoat pocket. "'I took the number, my lady, at the bank.' "'Very well. You keep it. While I am writing my letter, suppose you direct the envelope. What is the clergyman's name?' Moody mentioned the name and directed the envelope. Felix, happening to look round at Lady Lydiard and the steward while they were both engaged in writing, returned suddenly to the table as if he had been struck by a new idea. "'Is there a third pen?' he asked. "'Why shouldn't I write a line at once to Hardyman, aunt? "'The sooner you have his opinion about Tommy, the better, don't you think so?' Lady Lydiard pointed to the pen tray with a smile. To show consideration for her dog was to seize irresistibly on the high road to her favor. Felix set to work on his letter in a large scrambling handwriting with plenty of ink and a noisy pen. "'I declare we are like clerks in an office.' he remarked in his cheery way. All with our noses to the paper, writing as if we lived by it. Here, Moody, let one of the servants take this at once to Mr. Hardyman's. The messenger was dispatched. Robert returned and waited near his mistress with a directed envelope in his hand. Felix sauntered back slowly towards the picture gallery for the third time. In a moment more, Lady Lydiard finished her letter and folded up the banknote in it. She had just taken the directed envelope from Moody, and had just placed the letter inside it, when a scream from the inner room, in which Isabel was nursing the sick dog, startled everybody. "'My lady! My lady!' cried the girl, distractedly. "'Tommy is in a fit! Tommy is dying!' Lady Lydiard dropped the unclosed envelope on the table and ran. Yes, short as she was and fat as she was, ran into the inner room. The two men, left together, looked at each other. "'Moody!' said Felix, in his lazily cynical way. "'Do you think, if you or I were in a fit, that her ladyship would run?' "'Bah! These are the things that shake one's faith in human nature. I feel infernally seedy. That cursed channel passage, I tremble in my innermost stomach when I think of it. Get me something, Moody.' "'What shall I send you, sir?' Moody asked coldly. "'Some dry coraco and a biscuit.' and let it be brought to me in the picture gallery. Damn the dog! I'll go and look at Hobema. This time he succeeded in reaching the archway, and disappeared behind the curtains of the picture gallery. End of chapter 3 Recording by Todd Chapter 4 of My Lady's Money This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins Chapter 4 Left alone in the drawing-room, Moody looked at the unfastened envelope on the table. Considering the value of the enclosure, 
might he feel justified in wetting the gum and securing the envelope for safety's sake. After thinking it over, Moody decided that he was not justified in meddling with the letter. On reflection, her ladyship might have changes to make in it, or might have a postscript to add to what she had already written. Apart, too, from these considerations, was it reasonable to act as if Lady Lydiard's house was a hotel, perpetually open to the intrusion of strangers? Objects worth twice five hundred pounds in the aggregate were scattered about on the tables and in the unlocked cabinets all round him. Moody withdrew without further hesitation to order the light restorative prescribed for himself by Mr. Sweetsir. The footman, who took the curacao into the picture gallery, found Felix recumbent on a sofa, admiring the famous Hobema. "'Don't interrupt me,' he said peevishly, catching the servant in the act of staring at him. "'Put down the bottle and go.' Forbidden to look at Mr. Sweet, sir, the man's eyes, as he left the gallery, turned wonderingly towards the famous landscape. And what did he see? He saw one towering big cloud in the sky that threatened rain. Two withered mahogany-coloured trees, sorely in want of rain. A muddy road, greatly the worse for rain. And a vagabond boy running home, who was afraid of the rain. That was the picture to the footman's eye. He took a gloomy view of the state of Mr. Sweetsir's brains on his return to the servants' hall. A slate loose, poor devil. That was the footman's report of the brilliant Felix. Immediately on the servants' departure, the silence in the picture gallery was broken by voices penetrating into it from the drawing room. Felix rose to a sitting position on the sofa. He had recognised the voice of Alfred Hardyman, saying, "'Don't disturb, Lady Lydiard,' and the voice of Moody answering, "'I will just knock at the door of her ladyship's room, sir. You will find Mr. Sweet, sir, in the picture gallery.' The curtains over the archway parted, and disclosed the figure of a tall man, with a closely cropped head, set a little stiffly on his shoulders. The immovable gravity of face and manner, which every Englishman seems to acquire who lives constantly in the society of horses, was the gravity which this gentleman displayed as he entered the picture gallery. He was a finely made, sinewy man, with clearly cut, regular features. If he had not been affected with horses on the brain, he would doubtless have been personally popular with the women. As it was, the serene and hippic gloom of the handsome horse-breeder daunted the daughters of Eve, and they failed to make up their minds about the exact value of him socially considered. Alfred Hardyman was nevertheless a remarkable man in his way. He had been offered the customary alternatives submitted to the younger sons of the nobility, the church or the diplomatic service, and had refused the one and the other. "'I like horses,' he said, "'and I mean to get my living out of them. Don't talk to me about my position in the world. Talk to my eldest brother, who gets the money and the title.' Starting in life with these sensible views, and with a small capital of five thousand pounds, Hardyman took his own place in the sphere that was fitted for him. At the period of this narrative, he was already a rich man, and one of the greatest authorities on horse-breeding in England. His prosperity made no change in him. He was always the same grave, quiet, obstinately resolute man, true to the few friends whom he admitted to his intimacy, and sincere to a fault in the expression of his feelings among persons whom he distrusted or disliked. As he entered the picture-gallery, and paused for a moment, looking at Felix on the sofa, 
his large, cold, steady grey eyes rested on the little man with an indifference that just verged on contempt. Felix, on the other hand, sprang to his feet with alert politeness, and greeted his friend with exuberant cordiality. "'Dear old boy, this is so good of you,' he began. "'I feel it. I do assure you I feel it.' "'You needn't trouble yourself to feel it,' was the quietly ungracious answer. "'Lady Lydiard brings me here. I come to see the house and the dog.' He looked round the gallery in his gravely attentive way. "'I don't understand pictures,' he remarked resignedly. "'I shall go back to the drawing-room.' After a moment's consideration, Felix followed him into the drawing-room with the air of a man who was determined not to be repelled. "'Well?' asked Hardyman. "'What is it?' "'About that matter,' Felix said inquiringly. "'What matter?' "'Oh, you know. Will next week do?' "'Next week won't do.' Mr. Felix Sweetsir cast one look at his friend. His friend was too intently occupied with the decorations of the drawing-room to notice the look. "'Will to-morrow do?' Felix resumed, after an interval. "'Yes.' "'At what time?' "'Between twelve and one in the afternoon.' "'Between twelve and one in the afternoon,' Felix repeated. He looked again at Hardyman, and took his hat. "'Make my apologies to my aunt,' he said. "'You must introduce yourself to her ladyship. I can't wait here any longer.' He walked out of the room, having deliberately returned the contemptuous indifference of Hardyman by a similar indifference on his own side at parting. Left by himself, Hardyman took a chair and glanced at the door which led into the boudoir. The steward had knocked at that door, had disappeared through it, and had not appeared again. How much longer was Lady Lydiard's visitor to be left unnoticed in Lady Lydiard's house? As the question passed through his mind, the boudoir door opened. For once in his life, Alfred Hardyman's composure deserted him. He started to his feet, like an ordinary mortal taken completely by surprise. Instead of Mr. Moody, instead of Lady Lydiard, there appeared in the open doorway a young woman in a state of embarrassment, who actually quickened the beat of Mr. Hardyman's heart the moment he set eyes on her. Was the person who produced this amazing impression at first sight a person of importance? Nothing of the sort. She was only Isabel, surnamed Miller. Even her name had nothing in it. Only Isabel Miller. Had she any pretensions to distinction in virtue of her personal appearance? It is not easy to answer the question. The women, let us put the worst judges first, had long since discovered that she wanted that indispensable elegance of figure which is derived from slimness of waist and length of limb. The men, who were better acquainted with the subject, looked at her figure from their point of view, and finding it essentially embraceable, asked for nothing more. It might have been her bright complexion, or it might have been the bold luster of her eyes, as the women considered it, that dazzled the lords of creation generally, and made them all alike incompetent to discover her faults. Still, she had compensating attractions which no severity of criticism could dispute. Her smile, beginning at her lips, flowed brightly and instantly over her whole face. A delicious atmosphere of health 
freshness and good humour seemed to radiate from her wherever she went and whatever she did. For the rest, her brown hair grew low over her broad white forehead, and was topped by a neat little lace cap with ribbons of a violet colour. A plain collar and plain cuffs encircled her smooth round neck and her plump dimpled hands. Her merino dress, covering but not hiding the charming outline of her bosom, matched the colour of the cap ribbons, and was brightened by a white muslin apron coquettishly trimmed about the pockets. A gift from Lady Lydiard. Blushing and smiling, she let the door fall to behind her, and shyly approaching the stranger, said to him in her small clear voice, "'If you please, sir, are you Mr. Hardyman?' The gravity of the great horse-breeder deserted him at her first question. He smiled as he acknowledged that he was Mr. Hardyman. He smiled as he offered her a chair. "'No, thank you, sir,' she said, with a quaintly pretty inclination of her head. "'I am only sent here to make her ladyship's apologies. She has put the poor dear dog into a warm bath, and she can't leave him. And Mr. Moody can't come instead of me, because I was too frightened to be of any use, and so he had to hold the dog. That's all. We are very anxious, sir, to know if the warm bath is the right thing. Please come into the room and tell us." She led the way back to the door. Hardiman, naturally enough, was slow to follow her. When a man is fascinated by the charm of youth and beauty, he is in no hurry to transfer his attention to a sick animal in a bath. Hardiman seized on the first excuse that he could devise for keeping Isabel to himself. That is to say, for keeping her in the drawing-room. "'I think I shall be better able to help you,' he said, "'if you will tell me something about the dog first. Even his accent in speaking had altered to a certain degree. The quiet, dreary monotone in which he habitually spoke quickened a little under his present excitement. As for Isabel, she was too deeply interested in Tommy's welfare to suspect that she was being made the victim of a stratagem. She left the door and returned to Hardyman with eager eyes. "'What can I tell you, sir?' she asked innocently. Hardyman pressed his advantage without mercy. "'You can tell me what sort of dog he is?' "'Yes, sir. How old he is?' "'Yes, sir. What his name is, what his temper is, what his illness is, what diseases his father and mother had, what—' Isabel's head began to turn giddy. "'One thing at a time, sir,' she interposed with a gesture of entreaty. "'The dog sleeps on my bed, and I had a bad night with him. He disturbed me so. And I'm afraid I'm very stupid this morning.' "'His name is Tommy.' We are obliged to call him by it, because he won't answer to any other than the name he had when my lady bought him. But we spell it with an I-E at the end, which makes it less vulgar than Tommy with an A-Y. I am very sorry, sir. I forget what else you wanted to know. Please to come in here, and my lady will tell you everything. She tried to get back to the door of the boudoir. Hardiman, feasting his eyes on the pretty changeful face that looked up at him with such innocent confidence in his authority, drew her away from the door by the one means at his disposal. He returned to his questions about Tommy. "'Wait a little, please. What sort of dog is he?' Isabel turned back again from the door. To describe Tommy was a labour of love. "'He is the most beautiful dog in the world,' the girl began, with kindling eyes. "'He has the most exquisite white curly hair, and two light brown patches on his back, and—' 
oh such lovely dark eyes they call him a scotch terrier when he is well his appetite is truly wonderful nothing comes amiss to him sir from pate de foie gras to potatoes he has his enemies poor dear though you wouldn't think it people who won't put up with being bitten by him what shocking tempers one does meet with to be sure call him a mongrel isn't it a shame please come in and see him sir my lady will be tired of waiting another journey to the door followed those words checked instantly by a serious objection stop a minute you must tell me what his temper is or i can do nothing for him isabel returned once more feeling that it was really serious this time her gravity was even more charming than her gaiety as she lifted her face to him with large solemn eyes expressive of her sense of responsibility hardyman would have given every horse in his stables to have had the privilege of taking her in his arms and kissing her tommy has the temper of an angel with people he likes she said when he bites it generally means that he objects to strangers he loves my lady and he loves mr moody and he loves me and and i think that's all this way sir if you please i am sure i heard my lady call no said hardyman in his immovably obstinate way nobody called about the dog's temper doesn't he take to any strangers what sort of people does he bite in general isabel's pretty lips began to curl upward at the corners in a quaint smile hardyman's last imbecile question had opened her eyes to the true state of the case still tommy's future was in this strange gentleman's hands she felt bound to consider that and moreover it was no everyday event in isabel's experience to fascinate a famous personage who was also a magnificent and perfectly dressed man she ran the risk of wasting another minute or two and went on with the memoirs of tommy i must own sir she resumed that he behaves a little ungratefully even to strangers who take an interest in him when he gets lost in the streets which is very often he sits down on the pavement and howls till he collects a pitying crowd round him and when they try to read his name and address on his collar he snaps at them the servants generally find him and bring him back and as soon as he gets home he turns round on the doorstep and snaps at the servants i think it must be his fun you should see him sitting up in his chair at dinner-time waiting to be helped with his forepaws on the edge of the table like the hands of a gentleman at a public dinner making a speech but oh cried isabel checking herself with the tears in her eyes how can i talk of him in this way when he is so dreadfully ill some of them say it's bronchitis and some say it's his liver only yesterday i took him to the front door to give him a little air and he stood still on the pavement quite stupefied for the first time in his life he snapped at nobody who went by and oh dear he hadn't even the heart to smell a lamp-post isabel had barely stated this last afflicting circumstance when the memoirs of tommy were suddenly cut short by the voice of lady lydiard really calling this time from the inner room isabel isabel cried her ladyship what are you about isabel ran to the door of the boudoir and threw it open go in sir pray go in she said without you hardyman asked i will follow you sir i have something to do for her ladyship first she still held the door open 
and pointed entreatingly to the passage which led to the boudoir. "'I shall be blamed, sir,' she said, "'if you don't go in.' This statement of the case left Hardyman no alternative. He presented himself to Lady Lydiard without another moment of delay. Having closed the drawing-room door on him, Isabel waited a little, absorbed in her own thoughts. She was now perfectly well aware of the effect which she had produced on Hardyman. Her vanity, it is not to be denied, was flattered by his admiration. He was so grand and so tall, and he had such fine large eyes. The girl looked prettier than ever, as she stood with her head down and her colour heightened, smiling to herself. A clock on the chimney-piece striking the half-hour roused her. She cast one look at the glass as she passed it, and went to the table at which Lady Lydiard had been writing. Methodical Mr. Moody, in submitting to be employed as bath attendant upon Tommy, had not forgotten the interests of his mistress. He reminded her ladyship that she had left her letter with a banknote enclosed in it, unsealed. Absorbed in the dog, Lady Lydiard answered, "'Isabel is doing nothing. Let Isabel seal it. Show Mr. Hardyman in here,' she continued, turning to Isabel and then seal a letter of mine which you will find on the table. And when you have sealed it, careful Mr. Moody added, put it back on the table. I will take charge of it when her ladyship has done with me. Such were the special instructions which now detained Isabel in the drawing-room. She lighted the taper and closed and sealed the open envelope, without feeling curiosity enough even to look at the address. Mr. Hardyman was the uppermost subject in her thoughts. Leaving the sealed letter on the table, she returned to the fireplace and studied her own charming face attentively in the looking-glass. The time passed, and Isabel's reflection was still the subject of Isabel's contemplation. "'He must see many beautiful ladies,' she thought veering backward and forward between pride and humility. "'I wonder what he sees in me.' The clock struck the hour. Almost at the same moment the boudoir door opened, and Robert Moody, released at last from attendance on Tommy, entered the drawing-room. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of My Lady's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ali M. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins. Chapter 5. Well? asked Isabel eagerly. What does Mr. Hardiman say? Does he think he can cure Tommy? Moody answered a little coldly and stiffly. His dark, deeply set eyes rested on Isabel with an uneasy look. Mr. Hardiman seems to understand animals, he said. He lifted the dog's eyelid and looked at his eyes, and then he told us the bath was useless. Go on, said Isabel impatiently. He did something, I suppose, besides telling you that the bath was useless. He took a knife out of his pocket, with a lancet in it. Isabel clasped her hands with a faint cry of horror. "'Oh, Mr. Moody, did he hurt Tommy?' "'Hurt him?' Moody repeated, indignant at the interest which she felt in the animal, and the indifference which she exhibited towards the man, as represented by himself. "'Hurt him, indeed! Mr. Hardiman bled the brute!' "'Brute?' Isabel reiterated with flashing eyes. I know some people, Mr. Moody, who really deserve to be called by that horrid word. If you can't say Tommy when you speak of him in my presence, be so good as to say the dog. Moody yielded with the worst possible grace. Oh, very well. Mr. Hardiman bled the dog, 
and brought him to his senses directly. I am charged to tell you. He stopped, as if the message which he was instructed to deliver was in the last degree distasteful to him. Well, what were you charged to tell me? I was to say that Mr. Hardiman will give you instructions how to treat the dog in the future. Isabel hastened to the door, eager to receive her instructions. Moody stopped her before she could open it. You are in a great hurry to get to Mr. Hardiman, he remarked. Isabel looked back at him in surprise. You said just now that Mr. Hardiman was waiting to tell me how to nurse Tommy. Let him wait, Moody rejoined sternly. When I left him, he was sufficiently occupied in expressing his favorable opinion of you to her ladyship. The steward's pale face turned paler still as he said those words. With the arrival of Isabel in Lady Lidyard's house, his time had come, exactly as the women in the servants' hall had predicted. At last the impenetrable man felt the influence of the sex. At last he knew the passion of love misplaced, ill-starred, hopeless love, for a woman who was young enough to be his child. He had already spoken to Isabel more than once in terms which told his secret plainly enough, but the smoldering fire of jealousy in the man, fanned into flame by Hardiman, now showed itself for the first time. His looks, even more than his words, would have warned a woman with any knowledge of the natures of men to be careful how she answered him. Young, giddy, and inexperienced, Isabel followed the flippant impulse of the moment, without a thought of the consequences. "'I'm sure it's very kind of Mr. Hardiman to speak favorably of me,' she said, with a pert little laugh. "'I hope you are not jealous of him, Mr. Moody.' Moody was in no humor to make allowances for the unbridled gaiety of youth and good spirits. "'I hate any man who admires you,' he burst out passionately. "'Let him be who he may.' Isabel looked at her strange lover with unaffected astonishment. How unlike Mr. Hardiman, who had treated her as a lady from first to last! "'What an odd man you are,' she said. "'You can't take a joke. I'm sure I didn't mean to offend you.' You don't offend me. You do worse. You distress me." Isabel's color began to rise. The merriment died out of her face. She looked at Moody gravely. "'I don't like to be accused of distressing people when I don't deserve it,' she said. "'I had better leave you. Let me by, if you please.' Having committed one error in offending her, Moody committed another in attempting to make his peace with her. Acting under the fear that she would really leave him, he took her roughly by the arm. "'You are always trying to get away from me,' he said. "'I wish I knew how to make you like me, Isabel.' "'I don't allow you to call me Isabel,' she retorted, struggling to free herself from his hold. "'Let go of my arm. You hurt me.' Moody dropped her arm with a bitter sigh. "'I don't know how to deal with you,' he said simply. "'Have some pity on me.' If the steward had known anything of women, at Isabel's age, he would never have appealed to her mercy in those plain terms, and at the unpropitious moment. "'Pity you?' she repeated contemptuously. "'Is that all you have to say to me after hurting my arm? What a bear you are!' She shrugged her shoulders and put her hands coquettishly into the pockets of her apron. That was how she pitied him. His face turned paler and paler. He writhed under it. "'For God's sake, don't turn everything I say to you into ridicule,' he cried. "'You know I love you with all my heart and soul. Again and again I have asked you to be my wife, and you laugh at me as if it were a joke. I haven't deserved to be treated in that cruel way. It maddens me. I can't endure it.' Isabel looked down on the floor, and followed the lines in the pattern of the carpet with the end of her smart little shoe. She could hardly have been further away from really understanding Moody if he had spoken in Hebrew. She was partly startled, partly puzzled, by the strong emotions which she had unconsciously called into being. "'Oh, dear me,' she said, "'why can't you talk of something else? Why can't we be friends? Excuse me for mentioning it,' she went on, looking up at him with a saucy smile. "'You are old enough to be my father.' Moody's head sank on his breast. I own it, 
he answered humbly, but there is something to be said for me. Men as old as I am have made good husbands before now. I would devote my whole life to make you happy. There isn't a wish you could form which I wouldn't be proud to obey. You must not reckon me by years. My youth has not been wasted in a profligate life. I can be truer to you and fonder of you than many a younger man. Surely my heart is not quite unworthy of you when it is all yours. I have lived such a lonely, miserable life, and you might so easily brighten it. You are kind to everybody else, Isabel. Tell me, dear, why are you so hard on me? His voice trembled as he appealed to her in those simple words. He had taken the right way at last to produce an impression on her. She really felt for him. All that was true and tender in her nature began to rise in her and take his part. Unhappily, he felt too deeply and too strongly to be patient and give her time. He completely misinterpreted her silence, completely mistook the motive that made her turn aside for a moment to gather composure enough to speak to him. Ah! he burst out bitterly, turning away on his side. You have no heart. She instantly resented those unjust words. At that moment they wounded her to the quick. You know best, she said. I have no doubt you are right. Remember one thing, however, that though I have no heart, I have never encouraged you, Mr. Moody. I have declared over and over again that I could only be your friend. Understand that for the future, if you please. There are plenty of nice women who will be glad to marry you, I have no doubt. You will always have my best wishes for your welfare. Good morning. Her ladyship will wonder what has become of me. Be so kind as to let me pass. Tortured by the passion that consumed him, Moody obstinately kept his place between Isabel and the door. The unworthy suspicion of her, which had been in his mind all through the interview, now forced its way outwards to expression at last. No woman has ever used a man as you use me without some reason for it, he said. You have kept your secret wonderfully well, but sooner or later all secrets get found out. I know what is in your mind as well as you know it yourself. You are in love with some other man. Isabel's face flushed deeply. The defensive pride of her sex was up in arms in an instant. She cast one disdainful look at Moody, without troubling herself to express her contempt in words. "'Stand out of my way, sir,' that was all she said to him. "'You are in love with some other man,' he reiterated passionately. "'Deny it if you can.' "'Deny it?' she repeated, with flashing eyes. "'What right have you to ask the question? Am I not free to do as I please?' He stood looking at her, meditating his next words with a sudden and sinister change to self-restraint. Suppressed rage was in his rigidly set eyes, suppressed rage was in his trembling hand as he raised it emphatically while he spoke his next words. "'I have one more thing to say,' he answered. "'And then I have done. If I am not your husband, no other man shall be. Look well to it, Isabel Miller.' If there is another man between us, I can tell him this. He shall find it no easy matter to rob me of you. She started and turned pale, but it was only for a moment. The high spirit that was in her rose brightly in her eyes and faced him without shrinking. Threats? she said with quiet contempt. When you make love, Mr. Moody, you take strange ways of doing it. My conscience is easy. You may try to frighten me, but you will not succeed. When you have recovered your temper, I will accept your excuses. She paused and pointed to the table. There is the letter that you told me to leave for you when I had sealed it. She went on. I suppose you have her ladyship's orders. Isn't it time you began to think of obeying them? The contemptuous composure of her tone and manner seemed to act on Moody with crushing effect. Without a word of answer, the unfortunate steward took up the letter from the table. Without a word of answer, he walked mechanically to the great door which opened on the staircase, turned on the threshold to look at Isabel, waited a moment, pale and still, and suddenly left the room. That silent departure, that hopeless submission, impressed Isabel in spite of herself. 
the sustaining sense of injury and insult sank as it were from under her the moment she was alone he had not been gone a minute before she began to be sorry for him once more the interview had taught her nothing she was neither old enough nor experienced enough to understand the overwhelming revolution produced in a man's character when he feels the passion of love for the first time in the maturity of his life if moody had stolen a kiss at the first opportunity she would have resented the liberty he had taken with her but she would have thoroughly understood him his terrible earnestness his overpowering agitation his abrupt violence all these evidences of a passion that was a mystery to himself simply puzzled her i'm sure i didn't wish to hurt his feelings such was the form that her reflections took in her present penitent frame of mind but why did he provoke me it is a shame to tell me that i love some other man when there is no other man i declare i begin to hate the men if they are all like mr moody i wonder whether he will forgive me when he sees me again i'm sure i'm willing to forget and forgive on my side especially if he won't insist on my being fond of him because he is fond of me oh dear i wish he would come back and shake hands it's enough to try the patience of a saint to be treated in this way i wish i were ugly the ugly ones have a quiet time of it the men let them be mr moody mr moody she went out to the landing and called to him softly there was no answer he was no longer in the house she stood still for a moment in silent vexation i'll go to tommy she decided i'm sure he's the more agreeable company of the two and oh good gracious there's mr hardiman waiting to give me my instructions how do i look i wonder she consulted the glass once more gave one or two corrective touches to her hair and her cap and hastened into the boudoir end of chapter 5 recording by ally m chapter 6 of my lady's money this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins. Chapter 6. For a quarter of an hour, the drawing room remained empty. At the end of that time, the council in the boudoir broke up. Lady Lydiard, led the way back into the drawing-room, followed by Hardyman, Isabel being left to look after the dog. Before the door closed behind him, Hardyman turned round to reiterate his last medical directions, or, in plainer words, to take a last look at Isabel. Plenty of water, Miss Isabel, for the dog to lap, and a little bread or biscuit, if he wants something to eat. Nothing more, if you please, till i see him to-morrow thank you sir i will take the greatest care at that point lady lydiard cut short the interchange of instructions and civilities shut the door if you please mr hardyman i feel the draught many thanks i am really at a loss to tell you how gratefully i feel your kindness but for you my poor little dog might be dead by this time hardyman answered in the quiet, melancholy monotone which was habitual with him. Your ladyship need feel no further anxiety about the dog. Only be careful not to overfeed him. He will do very well under Miss Isabel's care. By the by, her family name is Miller, is it not? Is she related to the Warwickshire Millers of Duxborough House? Lady Lydiard, looked at him with an expression of satirical surprise mr hardyman she said this makes the fourth time you have questioned me about isabel you seem to take a great interest in my little companion don't make any apologies pray you pay isabel a compliment and as i am very fond of her i am naturally gratified when i find her admired at the same time she added with one of her abrupt transitions of language, I had my eye on you, and I had my eye on her when you were talking in the next room, 
and i don't mean to let you make a fool of the girl she is not in your line of life and the sooner you know it the better you make me laugh when you ask if she is related to gentlefolks she is the orphan daughter of a chemist in the country her relations haven't a penny to bless themselves with except an old aunt who lives in a village on two or three hundred a year i heard of the girl by accident when she lost her father and mother her aunt offered to take her isabel said no thank you i will not be a burden on a relation who has only enough for herself a girl can earn an honest living if she tries and i mean to try that's what she said i admired her independence her ladyship proceeded ascending again to the higher regions of thought and expression my niece's marriage just at that time had left me alone in this great house i proposed to isabel to come to me as companion and reader for a few weeks and to decide for herself whether she liked the life or not we have never been separated since that time i could hardly be fonder of her if she were my own daughter and she returns my affection with all her heart she has excellent qualities prudent cheerful sweet-tempered with good sense enough to understand what her place is in the world as distinguished from her place in my regard i have taken care for her own sake never to leave that part of the question in any doubt it would be cruel kindness to deceive her as to her future position when she marries i shall take good care that the man who pays his addresses to her is a man in her rank of life i know but too well in the case of one of my own relatives what miseries unequal marriages may bring with them excuse me for troubling you at this length on domestic matters i am very fond of isabel and a girl's head is so easily turned now you know what her position really is you will also know what limits there must be to the expression of your interest in her i am sure we understand each other and i say no more hardyman listened to this long harangue with the immovable gravity which was part of his character except when isabel had taken him by surprise when her ladyship gave him the opportunity of speaking on his side he had very little to say and that little did not suggest that he had greatly profited by what he had heard his mind had been full of isabel when lady lydiard began and it remained just as full of her in just the same way when lady lydiard had done yes he remarked quietly miss isabel is an uncommonly nice girl as you say very pretty and such frank unaffected manners i don't deny that i feel an interest in her the young ladies one meets in society are not much to my taste miss isabel is my taste lady lydiard's face assumed a look of blank dismay i am afraid i have failed to convey my exact meaning to you she said hardyman gravely declared that he understood her perfectly perfectly he repeated with his impenetrable obstinacy your ladyship exactly expresses my opinion of miss isabel prudent and cheerful and sweet-tempered as you say all the qualities in a woman that i admire with good looks too of course with good looks she will be a perfect treasure as you remarked just now to the man who marries her i may claim to know something about it i have twice narrowly escaped being married myself and though i can't exactly explain it i'm all the harder to please in consequence miss isabel pleases me i think i have said that before pardon me for saying it again i'll call again to-morrow morning and look at the dog as early as eleven o'clock if you will allow me later in the day i must be off to france to attend a sale of horses glad to have been of any use to your ladyship i am sure good morning lady lydiard let him go wisely resigning any further attempt to establish an understanding between her visitor and herself he is either a person of very limited intelligence when he is away from his stables she thought or he deliberately declines 
to take a plain hint when it is given to him i can't drop his acquaintance on tommy's account the only other alternative is to keep isabel out of his way my good little girl shall not drift into a false position while i am living to look after her when mr hardyman calls to-morrow she shall be out on an errand when he calls the next time she shall be upstairs with a headache and if he tries it again she shall be away at my house in the country if he makes any remarks on her absence well he will find that i can be just as dull of understanding as he is when the occasion calls for it having arrived at this satisfactory solution of the difficulty lady lydiard became conscious of an irresistible impulse to summon isabel to her presence and caress her in the nature of a warm-hearted woman this was only the inevitable reaction which followed the subsidence of anxiety about the girl after her own resolution had set that anxiety at rest she threw open the door and made one of her sudden appearances at the boudoir even in the fervent outpouring of her affection there was still the inherent abruptness of manner which so strongly marked lady lydiard's character in all the relations of life did i give you a kiss this morning she asked when isabel rose to receive her yes my lady said the girl with her charming smile come then and give me a kiss in return do you love me very well then treat me like your mother never mind my lady this time give me a good hug something in those homely words or something perhaps in the look that accompanied them touched sympathies in isabel which seldom showed themselves on the surface her smiling lips trembled the bright tears rose in her eyes you are too good to me she murmured with her head on lady lydiard's bosom how can i ever love you enough in return lady lydiard patted the pretty head that rested on her with such filial tenderness there there she said go back and play with tommy my dear we may be as fond of each other as we like but we mustn't cry god bless you go away go away she turned aside quickly her own eyes were moistening and it was part of her character to be reluctant to let isabel see it why have i made a fool of myself she wondered as she approached the drawing-room door it doesn't matter i am all the better for it odd that mr hardyman should have made me feel fonder of isabel than ever with those reflections she re-entered the drawing-room and suddenly checked herself with a start good heavens she exclaimed irritably how you frightened me why was i not told you were here having left the drawing-room in a state of solitude lady lydiard on her return found herself suddenly confronted with a gentleman mysteriously planted on the hearth-rug in her absence the new visitor might be rightly described as a grey man he had grey hair eyebrows and whiskers he wore a grey coat waistcoat and trousers and grey gloves for the rest his appearance was eminently suggestive of wealth and respectability and in this case appearances were really to be trusted the grey man was no other than lady lydiard's legal adviser mr troy i regret my lady that i should have been so unfortunate as to startle you he said with a certain underlying embarrassment in his manner i had the honour of sending word by mr moody that i would call at this hour on some matters of business connected with your ladyship's house property i presumed that you expected to find me here waiting your pleasure thus far lady lydiard had listened to her legal adviser fixing her eyes on his face in her usually frank straightforward way she now stopped him in the middle of a sentence with a change of expression in her own face which was undisguisedly a change to alarm don't apologize mr troy she said i am to blame for forgetting your appointment and for not keeping my nerves under proper control she paused for a moment and took a seat before she said her next words may i ask she resumed if there is something unpleasant in the business that brings you here 
nothing whatever my lady mere formalities which can wait till to-morrow or next day if you wish it lady lydiard's fingers drummed impatiently on the table you have known me long enough mr troy to know that i cannot endure suspense you have something unpleasant to tell me the lawyer respectfully remonstrated really lady lydiard he began it won't do mr troy i know how you look at me on ordinary occasions and i see how you look at me now you are a very clever lawyer but happily for the interest that i commit to your charge you are also a thoroughly honest man after twenty years experience of you you can't deceive me you bring me bad news speak at once sir and speak plainly mr troy yielded inch by inch as it were i bring news which i fear may annoy your ladyship he paused and advanced another inch it is news which i only became acquainted with myself on entering this house he waited again and made another advance i happened to meet your ladyship's steward mr moody in the hall where is he lady lydiard interposed angrily i can make him speak out and i will send him here instantly the lawyer made a last effort to hold off the coming disclosure a little longer mr moody will be here directly he said mr moody requested me to prepare your ladyship will you ring the bell mr troy or must i moody had evidently been waiting outside while the lawyer spoke for him he saved mr troy the trouble of ringing the bell by presenting himself in the drawing-room lady lydiard's eyes searched his face as he approached her bright complexion faded suddenly not a word more passed her lips she looked and waited in silence on his part moody laid an open sheet of paper on the table the paper quivered in his trembling hand lady lydiard recovered herself first is that for me she asked yes my lady she took up the paper without an instant's hesitation both the men watched her anxiously as she read it the handwriting was strange to her the words were these i hereby certify that the bearer of these lines robert moody by name has presented to me the letter with which he was charged addressed to himself with the seal intact i regret to add that there is to say the least of it some mistake the enclosure referred to by the anonymous writer of the letter who signs a friend in need has not reached me no five hundred pound banknote was in the letter when i opened it my wife was present when i broke the seal and can certify to this statement if necessary not knowing who my charitable correspondent is mr moody being forbidden to give me any information i can only take this means of stating the case exactly as it stands and hold myself at the disposal of the writer of the letter my private address is at the head of the page samuel bradstock rector st anne's deansbury london lady lydiard dropped the paper on the table for the moment plainly as the rector's statement was expressed she appeared to be incapable of understanding it what in god's name does this mean she asked the lawyer and the steward looked at each other which of the two was entitled to speak first lady lydiard gave them no time to decide moody she said sternly you took charge of the letter i look to you for an explanation moody's dark eyes flashed he answered lady lydiard without caring to conceal that he resented the tone in which she had spoken to him i undertook to deliver the letter at its address he said i found it sealed on the table your ladyship has the clergyman's written testimony that i handed it to him with the seal unbroken i have done my duty and i have no explanation to offer before lady lydiard could speak again mr troy discreetly interfered he saw plainly that his experience was required to lead the investigation in the right direction pardon me my lady he said with that happy mixture of the positive and the polite in his manner of which lawyers alone possess the secret there is only one way of arriving at the truth in painful matters of this sort 
we must begin at the beginning may i venture to ask your ladyship a question lady lydiard felt the composing influence of mr troy i am at your disposal sir she said quietly are you absolutely certain that you enclosed the banknote in the letter the lawyer asked i certainly believe i enclosed it lady lydiard answered but i was so alarmed at the time by the sudden illness of my dog that i do not feel justified in speaking positively was anybody in the room with your ladyship when you put the enclosure in the letter as you believe i was in the room said moody i can swear that i saw her ladyship put the banknote in the letter and the letter in the envelope and seal the envelope asked mr troy no sir her ladyship was called away into the next room to the dog before she could seal the envelope mr troy addressed himself once more to lady lydiard did your ladyship take the letter into the next room with you i was too much alarmed to think of it mr troy i left it here on the table with the envelope open yes how long were you absent in the other room half an hour or more ha said mr troy to himself this complicates it a little he reflected for a while and then turned again to moody did any of the servants know of this banknote being in her ladyship's possession not one of them moody answered do you suspect any of the servants certainly not sir are there any workmen employed in the house no sir do you know of any persons who had access to the room while lady lydiard was absent from it two visitors called sir who were they her ladyship's nephew mr felix sweetsir and the honorable alfred hardyman mr troy shook his head irritably i am not speaking of gentlemen of high position and repute he said it's absurd even to mention mr sweetsir and mr hardyman my question related to strangers who might have obtained access to the drawing-room people calling with her ladyship's sanction for subscriptions for instance or people calling with articles of dress or ornament to be submitted to her ladyship's inspection no such persons came to the house with my knowledge moody answered mr troy suspended the investigation and took a turn thoughtfully in the room the theory on which his inquiries had proceeded thus far had failed to produce any results his experience warned him to waste no more time on it and to return to the starting point of the investigation in other words to the letter shifting his point of view he turned again to lady lydiard and tried his questions in a new direction mr moody mentioned just now he said that your ladyship was called into the next room before you could seal your letter on your return to this room did you seal the letter i was busy with the dog lady lydiard answered isabel miller was of no use in the boudoir and i told her to seal it for me mr troy started the new direction in which he was pushing his inquiries began to look like the right direction already miss isabel miller he proceeded has been a resident under your ladyship's roof for some little time i believe for nearly two years mr troy as your ladyship's companion and reader as my adopted daughter her ladyship answered with marked emphasis wise mr troy rightly interpreted the emphasis as a warning to him to suspend the examination of her ladyship and to address to mr moody the far more serious questions which were now to come did any one give you the letter before you left the house with it he said to the steward or did you take it yourself i took it myself from the table here was it sealed yes was anybody present when you took the letter from the table miss isabel was present did you find her alone in the room yes sir lady lydiard opened her lips to speak and checked herself mr troy having cleared the ground before him put the fatal question mr moody he said when miss isabel was instructed to seal the letter did she know that a banknote was enclosed in it instead of replying robert drew back from the lawyer with a look of horror lady lydiard started to her feet and checked herself again on the point of speaking answer him moody she said putting a strong constraint on herself 
Robert answered very unwillingly. I took the liberty of reminding her ladyship that she had left her letter unsealed, he said, and I mentioned as my excuse for speaking, he stopped and corrected himself, I believe I mentioned that a valuable enclosure was in the letter. You believe, Mr. Troy repeated, can't you speak more positively than that? I can speak positively, said Lady Lydiard, with her eyes on the lawyer. Moody did mention the enclosure in the letter, in Isabel Miller's hearing, as well as in mine. She paused, steadily controlling herself. And what of that, Mr. Troy, she added, very quietly and firmly. Mr. Troy answered quietly and firmly on his side. I am surprised that your ladyship should ask the question, he said. I persist in repeating the question, Lady Lydiard rejoined. I say that Isabel Miller knew of the enclosure in my letter, and I ask, what of that? And I answer, retorted the impenetrable lawyer, that the suspicion of theft rests on your ladyship's adopted daughter and on nobody else. It's false, cried Robert, with a burst of honest indignation. I wish to God I had never said a word to you about the loss of the banknote. Oh, my lady, my lady, don't let him distress you. What does he know about it? Hush, said Lady Lydiard. Control yourself and hear what he has to say. She rested her hand on Moody's shoulder, partly to encourage him, partly to support herself, and, fixing her eyes again on Mr. Troy, repeated his last words. Suspicion rests on my adopted daughter and on nobody else. Why on nobody else? Is your ladyship prepared to suspect the rector of St. Anne's of embezzlement, or your own relatives and equals of theft? Mr. Troy asked. Does a shadow of doubt rest on the servants? Not if Mr. Moody's evidence is to be believed, who, to our own certain knowledge, had access to the letter while it was unsealed, who was alone in the room with it, and who knew of the enclosure in it. I leave the answer to your ladyship. Isabel Miller is as incapable of an act of theft as I am. There is my answer, Mr. Troy. The lawyer bowed resignedly and advanced to the door. Am I to take your ladyship's generous assertion as finally disposing of the question of the lost banknote? he inquired. Lady Lydiard met the challenge without shrinking from it. No, she said, the loss of the banknote is known out of my house. Other persons may suspect this innocent girl as you suspect her. It is due to Isabel's reputation, her unstained reputation, Mr. Troy, that she should know what has happened and should have an opportunity of defending herself. She is in the next room, Moody. Bring her here. Robert's courage failed him. He trembled at the bare idea of exposing Isabel to the terrible ordeal that awaited her. "'Oh, my lady,' he pleaded, "'think again before you tell the poor girl that she is suspected of theft. Keep it a secret from her. The shame of it will break her heart.' "'Keep it a secret,' said Lady Lydiard, "'when the rector and the rector's wife both know of it. Do you think they will let the matter rest where it is?' even if I could consent to hush it up. I must write to them, and I can't write anonymously after what has happened. Put yourself in Isabel's place, and tell me if you would think the person who knew you to be innocently exposed to a disgraceful suspicion, and who concealed it from you. Go, Moody. The longer you delay, the harder it will be. With his head sunk on his breast, with anguish written in every line of his face, Moody obeyed, passing slowly down the short passage which connected the two rooms, and still shrinking from the duty that had been imposed on him, he paused, looking through the curtains which hung over the entrance to the boudoir. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of My Lady's Money this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. 
My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins, Chapter 7. The sight that met Moody's view wrung him to the heart. Isabel and the dog were at play together. Among the varied accomplishments possessed by Tommy, the capacity to take his part at a game of hide-and-seek was one. His playfellow, for the time being, put a shawl or a handkerchief over his head so as to prevent him from seeing, and then hid among the furniture a pocket-book or a cigar-case or a purse or anything else that happened to be at hand, leaving the dog to find it with his keen sense of smell to guide him. Doubly relieved by the fit and the bleeding, Tommy's spirits had revived, and he and Isabel had just begun their game when Moody looked into the room, charged with his terrible errand. "'You're burning, Tommy, you're burning,' cried the girl, laughing and clapping her hands. The next moment she happened to look round and saw Moody through the parted curtains. His face warned her instantly that something serious had happened. She advanced a few steps, her eyes resting on him in silent alarm. He was himself too painfully agitated to speak. Not a word was exchanged between Lady Lydiard and Mr. Troy in the next room. In the complete stillness that prevailed, the dog was heard sniffing and fidgeting about the furniture. Robert took Isabel by the hand and led her into the drawing-room. "'For God's sake, spare her, my lady,' he whispered. The lawyer heard him. "'No,' said Mr. Troy, "'be merciful and tell her the truth.' He spoke to a woman who stood in no need of his advice. The inherent nobility in Lady Lydiard's nature was aroused. Her great heart offered itself patiently to any sorrow, to any sacrifice. Putting her arm round Isabel, half caressing her, half supporting her, Lady Lydiard accepted the whole responsibility and told the whole truth. Reeling under the first shock, the poor girl recovered herself with admirable courage. She raised her head and eyed the lawyer without uttering a word. In its artless consciousness of innocence, the look was nothing less than sublime. Addressing herself to Mr. Troy, Lady Lydiard pointed to Isabel. "'Do you see guilt there?' she asked. Mr. Troy made no answer. In the melancholy experience of humanity to which his profession condemned him, he had seen conscious guilt assume the face of innocence, and helpless innocence admit the disguise of guilt. The keenest observation, in either case, failed completely to detect the truth. Lady Lydiard misinterpreted his silence as expressing the sullen self-assertion of a heartless man. She turned from him, in contempt, and held out her hand to Isabel. "'Mr. Troy is not satisfied yet,' she said bitterly. "'My love, take my hand, and look me in the face as your equal. I know no difference of rank at such time as this. Before God, who hears you, are you innocent of the theft of the banknote?' "'Before God, who hears me,' Isabel answered, "'I am innocent.' Lady Lydiard looked once more at the lawyer, and waited to hear if he believed that. Mr. Troy took refuge in dumb diplomacy. He made a low bow. It might have meant that he believed Isabel, or it might have meant that he modestly withdrew his own opinion into the background. Lady Lydiard did not condescend to inquire what it meant. "'The sooner we bring this painful scene to an end, the better,' she said." I shall be glad to avail myself of your professional assistance, Mr. Troy, within certain limits. Outside of my house, I beg that you will spare no trouble in tracing the lost money to the person who has really stolen it. Inside of my house, I must positively request that the disappearance of the note may never be alluded to, in any way whatever, until your inquiries have been successful in discovering the thief. In the meanwhile, Mrs. Talmadge and her family must not be sufferers by my loss. I shall pay the money again. She paused and pressed Isabel's hand with affectionate fervor. My child, she said, one last word to you, and I have done. You remain here with my trust in you, and my love for you absolutely unshaken. When you think of what has been said here today, never forget that. 
Isabel bent her head and kissed the kind hand that still held hers. The high spirit that was in her, inspired by Lady Lydiard's example, rose equal to the dreadful situation in which she was placed. "'No, my lady,' she said calmly and sadly, "'it cannot be. What this gentleman has said of me is not to be denied. The appearances are against me. The letter was open, and I was alone in the room with it, and Mr. Moody told me that a valuable enclosure was inside it. Dear and kind mistress, I am not fit to be a member of your household. I am not worthy to live with the honest people who serve you, while my innocence is in doubt. It is enough for me now that you don't doubt it. I can wait patiently after that for the day that gives me back my good name. Oh, my lady, don't cry about it. Pray, pray, don't cry. Lady Lydiard's self-control failed her for the first time. Isabel's courage had made Isabel dearer to her than ever. She sank into a chair and covered her face with her handkerchief. Mr. Troy turned aside abruptly and examined a Japanese vase without any idea in his mind of what he was looking at. Lady Lydiard had gravely misjudged him in believing him to be a heartless man. Isabel followed the lawyer and touched him gently on the arm to rouse his attention. "'I have one relation living, sir, an aunt, who will receive me if I go to her,' she said simply. "'Is there any harm in my going? Lady Lydiard will give you the address when you want me. Spare her ladyship, sir, all the pain and trouble that you can.' At last the heart that was in Mr. Troy asserted itself. "'You are a fine creature,' he said, with a burst of enthusiasm. "'I agree with Lady Lydiard. I believe you are innocent, too, and I will leave no effort untried to find the proof of it.' He turned aside again, and had another look at the Japanese vase. As the lawyer withdrew himself from observation, Moody approached Isabel. Thus far he had stood apart, watching her, and listening to her in silence. Not a look that had crossed her face, not a word that had fallen from her, had escaped him. Unconsciously on her side, unconsciously on his side, she now wrought on his nature with a purifying and ennobling influence which animated it with a new life. All that had been selfish and violent in his passion for her left him to return no more. The immeasurable devotion which he laid at her feet in the days that were yet to come, the unyielding courage which cheerfully accepted the sacrifice of himself when events demanded it at a later period of his life, struck root in him now. Without attempting to conceal the tears that were falling fast over his cheeks, striving vainly to express those new thoughts in him that were beyond the reach of words, he stood before her the truest friend and servant that ever woman had. Oh, my dear, my heart is heavy for you. Take me to serve you and help you. Her ladyship's kindness will permit it, I am sure. He could say no more. In those simple words the cry of his heart reached her. Forgive me, Robert, she answered gratefully. If I said anything to pain you when we spoke together a little while since, I didn't mean it. She gave him her hand and looked timidly over her shoulder at Lady Lydiard. Let me go, she said, in low, broken tones. Let me go. Mr. Troy heard her, and stepped forward to interfere before Lady Lydiard could speak. The man had recovered his self-control. The lawyer took his place again on the scene. You must not leave us, my dear, he said to Isabel, until I have put a question to Mr. Moody, in which you are interested. Do you happen to have the number of the lost banknote? he asked turning to the steward. Moody produced his slip of paper with the number on it. Mr. Troy made two copies of it before he returned the paper. One copy he put in his pocket, the other he handed to Isabel. Keep it carefully, he said. Neither you nor I know how soon it may be of use to you. Receiving the copy from him, she felt mechanically in her apron for her pocketbook. She had used it in playing with the dog as an object to hide from him. But she had suffered, and was still suffering, too keenly to be capable of the effort of remembrance. 
moody eager to help her even in the most trifling thing guessed what had happened you were playing with tommy he said is it in the next room the dog heard his name pronounced through the open door the next moment he trotted into the drawing-room with isabel's pocket-book in his mouth he was a strong well-grown scotch terrier of the largest size with bright intelligent eyes and a coat of thick curling white hair diversified by two light brown patches on his back as he reached the middle of the room and looked from one to another of the persons present the fine sympathy of his race told him that there was trouble among his human friends his tail dropped he whined softly as he approached isabel and laid her pocket-book at her feet she knelt as she picked up the pocket-book and raised her playfellow of happier days to take her leave of him as the dog put his paws on her shoulders returning her caress her first tears fell foolish of me she said faintly to cry over a dog i can't help it good-bye tommy putting him away from her gently she walked towards the door the dog instantly followed she put him away from her for the second time and left him he was not to be denied he followed her again and took the skirt of her dress in his teeth as if to hold her back robert forced the dog growling and resisting with all his might to let go of the dress don't be rough with him said isabel put him on her ladyship's lap he will be quieter there robert obeyed he whispered to lady lydiard as she received the dog she seemed to be still incapable of speaking she bowed her head in silent assent robert hurried back to isabel before she had passed the door not alone he said entreatingly her ladyship permits it isabel let me see you safe to your aunt's house isabel looked at him felt for him and yielded yes she answered softly to make amends for what i said to you when i was thoughtless and happy she waited a little to compose herself before she spoke her farewell words to lady lydiard good-bye my lady your kindness has not been thrown away on an ungrateful girl i love you and thank you with all my heart lady lydiard arose placing the dog on the chair as she left it she seemed to have grown older by years instead of by minutes in the short interval that had passed since she had hidden her face from view i can't bear it she cried in husky broken tones isabel isabel i forbid you to leave me but one person could venture to resist her that person was mr troy and mr troy knew it control yourself he said to her in a whisper the girl is doing what is best and most becoming in her position and is doing it with a patience and courage wonderful to see she places herself under the protection of her nearest relative until her character is vindicated and her position in your house is once more beyond a doubt is this a time to throw obstacles in her way be worthy of yourself lady lydiard and think of the day when she will return to you without the breath of a suspicion to rest on her there was no disputing with him he was too plainly in the right lady lydiard submitted she concealed the torture that her own resolution inflicted on her with an endurance which was indeed worthy of herself taking isabel in her arms she kissed her in a passion of sorrow and love my poor dear my own sweet girl don't suppose that this is a parting kiss i shall see you again often and often i shall see you again at your aunt's at a sign from mr troy robert took isabel's arm in his and led her away tommy watching her from his chair lifted his little white muzzle as his playfellow looked back on passing the doorway the long melancholy farewell howl of the dog was the last sound isabel miller heard as she left the house. End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of My Lady's Money。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins. Chapter 8. On the day after Isabel's departure, 
diligent mr troy set forth for the head office in whitehall to consult the police on the question of the missing money he had previously sent information of the robbery to the bank of england and had also advertised the loss in the daily newspapers the air was so pleasant and the sun was so bright that he determined on proceeding to his destination on foot he was hardly out of sight of his own offices when he was overtaken by a friend who was also walking in the direction of whitehall this gentleman was a person of considerable worldly wisdom and experience he had been officially associated with cases of striking and notorious crime in which government had lent its assistance to discover and punish the criminals the opinion of a person in this position might be of the greatest value to mr troy whose practice as a solicitor had thus far never brought him into collision with thieves and mysteries he accordingly decided in isabel's interests on confiding to his friend the nature of his errand to the police concealing the name but concealing nothing else he described what had happened on the previous day at lady lydiard's house and then put the question plainly to his companion what would you do in my place in your place his friend answered quietly i should not waste time and money in consulting the police not consult the police exclaimed mr troy in amazement surely i have not made myself understood i am going to the head office and i have got a letter of introduction to the chief inspector in the detective department i am afraid i omitted to mention that it doesn't make any difference proceeded the other as coolly as ever you have asked for my advice and i give you my advice tear up your letter of introduction and don't stir a step further in the direction of whitehall mr troy began to understand you don't believe in the detective police he said who can believe in them who reads his newspaper and remembers what he reads his friend rejoined fortunately for the detective department the public in general forgets what it reads go to your club and look at the criminal history of our own time recorded in the newspapers every crime is more or less a mystery you will see that the mysteries which the police discover are almost without exception mysteries made penetrable by the commonest capacity through the extraordinary stupidity exhibited in the means taken to hide the crime on the other hand let the guilty man or woman be a resolute and intelligent person capable of setting his or her wits fairly against the wits of the police in other words let the mystery really be a mystery and cite me a case if you can a really difficult and perplexing case in which the criminal has not escaped mind i don't charge the police with neglecting their work no doubt they do their best and take the greatest pains in following the routine to which they have been trained it is their misfortune not their fault that there is no man of superior intelligence among them i mean no man who is capable in great emergencies of placing himself above conventional methods and following a new way of his own there have been such men in the police men naturally endowed with that faculty of mental analysis which can decompose a mystery resolve it into its component parts and find the clue at the bottom no matter how remote from ordinary observation it may be but those men have died or have retired one of them would have been invaluable to you in the case you have just mentioned to me as things are unless you are wrong in believing in the young lady's innocence the person who has stolen that banknote will be no easy person to find in my opinion there is only one man now in london who is likely to be of the slightest assistance to you and he is not in the police who is he asked mr troy an old rogue who was once in your branch of the legal profession the friend answered you may perhaps remember the name they call him old sharon what the scoundrel who was struck off the roll of attorneys years since is he still alive alive and prospering he lives in a court or lane running out of long acre and he offers advice to persons interested in recovering missing objects of any sort whether you have lost your wife or lost your cigar-case old sharon 
is equally useful to you he has an inbred capacity for reading the riddle the right way in cases of mystery great or small in short he possesses exactly that analytical faculty to which i alluded just now i have his address at my office if you think it worth while to try him who can trust such a man mr troy objected he would be sure to deceive me you are entirely mistaken since he was struck off the rolls old sharon has discovered that the straight way is on the whole the best way even in a man's own interests his consultation fee is a guinea and he gives a signed estimate beforehand for any supplementary expenses that may follow i can tell you that is of course strictly between ourselves that the authorities at my office took his advice in a government case that puzzled the police we approached him of course through persons who were to be trusted to represent us without betraying the source from which their instructions were derived and we found the old rascal's advice well worth paying for it is quite likely that he may not succeed so well in your case try the police by all means and if they fail why there is sharon as a last resort this arrangement commended itself to mr troy's professional caution he went on to whitehall and he tried the detective police they at once adopted the obvious conclusion to persons of ordinary capacity the conclusion that isabel was the thief acting on this conviction the authorities sent an experienced woman from the office to lady lydiard's house to examine the poor girl's clothes and ornaments before they were packed up and sent after her to her aunts the search led to nothing the only objects of any value that were discovered had been presents from lady lydiard no jewellers or milliners bills were among the papers found in her desk not a sign of secret extravagance in dress was to be seen anywhere defeated so far the police proposed next to have isabel privately watched there might be a prodigal lover somewhere in the background with ruin staring him in the face unless he could raise five hundred pounds lady lydiard who had only consented to the search under stress of persuasive argument from mr troy resented this ingenious idea as an insult she declared that if isabel was watched the girl should know of it instantly from her own lips the police listened with perfect resignation and decorum and politely shifted their ground a certain suspicion they remarked always rested in the cases of this sort on the servants would her ladyship object to private inquiries into the characters and proceedings of the servants her ladyship instantly objected in the most positive terms thereupon the inspector asked for a minute's private conversation with mr troy the thief is certainly a member of lady lydiard's household this functionary remarked in his politely positive way if her ladyship persists in refusing to let us make the necessary inquiries our hands are tied and the case comes to an end through no fault of ours if her ladyship changes her mind perhaps you will drop me a line sir to that effect good morning so the experiment of consulting the police came to an untimely end the one result obtained was the expression of purblind opinion by the authorities of the detective department which pointed to isabel or to one of the servants as the undiscovered thief thinking the matter over in the retirement of his own office and not forgetting his promise to isabel to leave no means untried of establishing her innocence mr troy could see but one alternative left to him he took up his pen and wrote to his friend at the government office there was nothing for it but to run the risk and try old sharon End of chapter eight